Right, good morning, everybody, um, and welcome. And welcome to Sir John Malnut, who's our preacher this morning. Um, I have an awful lot of notices, so don't go to sleep. <laughs> and I'm going to give them in more or less chronological order. Starting this Wednesday, there is the usual meeting for prayer on Zoom, but there are new Zoom meetings. Um, new Zoom details, which Alison Dowsett has got them as well. Um, so that's Wednesday at 8 p.m. on Zoom. The usual coffee morning on a Thursday morning and new Zoom details for that as well. Again, that's Alison. Next Sunday service, um, the Zoom link will be as usual, but to for those who don't know, it will change from the 16th of May when we restart services in the church with the church anniversary, that's the 16th of May. And then a, a forward notice that we're going to have a gift day on Sunday, the 6th of June. Next Friday, the 7th of May will be the monthly quiz and donations will be shared between our church and Christian Aid. And then there are two circuit notices. Mem members of the church council will know that there are some circuit staffing changes planned from September. And a Zoom meeting has been organized by the stewards at Tansley for people to meet on Zoom with um, the Reverend Robert Foster in order to be able to ask him questions and just find out what is happening. And um, I have more details, as will anyone who's on the church council. And anyone is welcome to join that meeting. It's on the 10th of May at seven o'clock. Um, I think that's a Monday, Monday the 10th of May. And the final notice is that, this is a circuit one, between the 13th and the 20th of May, the circuit have planned what they're calling a 24 seven prayer room, when it is hoped that someone will be praying during each hour in that week. You can pray as a group or you can pray singly. You can pray anywhere and you can be far from a computer. It's not something that's online, but the signing up so that each hour is covered is being done online and Rowanna knows far more about that than I do. So I would encourage you to sign up. It, there, are, there are details on the church website and can people sign up from there, Rowanna? Yeah, you can sign up. If you go on the church website, you can pick your hour or different hours and um, and pray. And there are also ideas for what to pray for. And now before I hand over to John, let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this new day. Thank you for the sunshine, for the clouds, and thank you for the rain. Please give us worshiping hearts and listening minds this morning. Please speak to us through John and also be with all those who don't do Zoom, those who will be with us on May the 16th. In Jesus' name, Amen. Hand over to John. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's uh, great to be back with you again. Um, it's on days like today where sometimes you wish the, uh, that we would have been making the journey, particularly for me, driving from Hena up to Matlock would have been a, a, a beautiful drive this morning, I'm sure. But um, nevertheless, I've made the, the long, arduous journey from the living room into my office um, and hoping that our uh, almost one year old now will stay nice and quiet um, and his teeth won't bother him too much. So you won't hear him this morning. But it's great to be worshipping with you. Um, and it's great that we can come together in this way, remembering all those who aren't with us and don't feel able to be with us at this point in time. And so following that prayer, we centre ourselves on our reason for gathering to come and to worship. And Psalm 22 says, all the rich of the earth will feast and worship. All who go down to the dust will kneel before him. 
those who cannot keep themselves alive. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn, he has done it. And so we're going to join in with um, that declaration that he has done it. And I've hidden all my controls behind something. So bear with me whilst I discover them again so we can uh, I can share the um, the song that we're going to sing now, which is Christ triumphant ever reigning. And so we continue saying yours, the glory and the crown and giving that high renown to our risen saviour, our King God, as we give thanks and we say thank you in our prayers. Let's pray together. Great and glorious God, we just want to say thank you this morning. Thank you for the people that we can see here on the screen. Thank you for the people who are worshipping elsewhere in different ways. Thank you for the technology that we can use that means we can still gather together in our separate places. Thank you for our family. Thank you for our friends. Thank you for the breakfast that we have eaten this morning. Thank you for the exciting plans that we have for today and the days coming. Thank you that the sun is shining. That blossom is falling from the trees like snow. Thank you for the bright colours of the flowers popping up and giving us joy. Thank you for the birds that fly and sing. Thank you for the animals which we love to see. Thank you that you created all of these things and you gave them to us telling us that you love us. You love us no matter what we do, no matter how often we say, not yet, God, no matter how often we say, God, just leave me alone. Or how many times we come saying, God, can you fix this for me? Can you do this? Can you do that? You continue to love us. You showed us how much you loved us when you sent your son, Jesus, to walk on this earth with us. He lived the life that we live. He felt the pain and joy of life, life given up to us by you. You did all this because you love us. Even though we don't deserve it. And so in a moment of quiet, we remember the things that we've done that have pushed you away when we perhaps haven't deserved your love. And we say sorry. Sorry, God, for speaking before, before we thought, for acting before we thought, for pushing you away, for thinking things weren't right when perhaps they were. But as you sent your son, declaring your love for us, you also declared that our sins are forgiven. So thank you, God, for your forgiveness and for your love. Thank you for Jesus' life, his death on the cross and his resurrection three days later. 
Thank you that Jesus has ascended to be next to you in heaven and that you left your spirit here on earth to work in and through us to continue to share your love with the world that we're a part of. Send your Holy Spirit to be with us now that we may hear you speak to us, that we may feel your presence with us. And that we may be stirred into action to share your love with those around us. We give you the glory this morning, God, for the great things that you have done. And we yearn to hear more from you. We offer these prayers in the name of your son, who is our saviour. Amen. We're thinking this morning about what it means to be successful. And so I share that with you uh, so you can think about success or otherwise uh, as we hear our reading, uh, which we're going to hear from John's Gospel now. The reading is from John's Gospel, Gospel 15, and it's verses 1 to 8 The Vine and the Branches. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Jane. I'd like uh, to take you back 12 years um, to August uh, 2009, if I've got my sums right. Um, one Thursday morning um, in August, to be precise. And it was A-level results day for me. Um, yes, that really was only 12 years ago, for those of you who are perhaps a little older than 12. The way that, um, and I, I'd applied for places at university, and so I was waiting for my A-level results to dictate to me the rest of my future. I was uh, frantically early that morning refreshing um, the UCAS website, which is where um, applications to universities um, are dealt with, waiting for that to be updated to tell me uh, how I had done. I was uh, met when it finally had updated with the words, congratulations, your place at the University of East Anglia has been confirmed. You're probably thinking, well, that's great. You've, you've got a place at university. But in a strange twist, um, those words, as I read them, did not fill me with the elation and excitement that perhaps you might expect. I was uh, disappointed because I didn't want to go to the University of East Anglia. That was my second choice. I had uh, made my first choice as Sheffield. And that is where I had set my heart on going. And so this meant that um, the results that I had got 
weren't good enough to go to Sheffield. I had been unsuccessful in getting the results that I needed. Later on that morning, um, I traipsed off to my sixth form college to go and find out what results I had actually got in a strange um, chronology. I could find out whether I got into university before knowing how I'd actually done in my exams. I went and picked up my results, opened the envelope and found that I had got ABC. You're probably thinking, well, they're great results, ABC, and, and they are really, really good results. I passed all my exams. I've done really well. Success. Yet I hadn't got the place at university that I really wanted to. Unsuccessful. Towards the end of next week, there's going to be a whole variety of people who are declared successful or unsuccessful. Political parties are going to be clamouring to declare themselves successful and their opponents unsuccessful. We're already beginning to hear the excuses uh, coming out. We're already hearing the blame game starting, aren't we? I'm, of course, there talking about our local elections happening on Thursday this week. This is not uh, the place nor the time to discuss the various pros and cons of the different voting systems that are around. But I will make this observation. We currently use the first past the post voting system. And that declares the successful candidate as the person who's got the most votes out of everyone. But that does mean that the successful candidate can be elected by a minority. If you add up all the votes that were cast for the unsuccessful candidates, they can add up to more than the total votes that the successful candidate got. So they have been successful in getting the most votes compared with each individual candidate yet they have been unsuccessful in getting the majority of votes when compared with the total votes that have been cast, what we might call the popular vote. What then is success? It seems to me that we use measures of success, which are very easy to measure and compare with others using the same measurement. How much money has been made? How many things have been sold? How many people attended an, an event? How satisfied people were? How fast something is uh, for the Formula One fans amongst us? How many things can you remember and apply to exam questions? In the passage that we heard there from John, Jesus is suggesting an even simpler way of measuring success. Does a branch produce fruit? And for those of you who are early, we were talking about seedlings and if they have survived um, the strange mix of weather that we've had. Does a branch produce fruit? Does a seedling survive a mixture of weather? Jesus goes on to say that if a branch does produce fruit, it is then nurtured and encouraged to produce even more fruit. But if there is no fruit on that branch, it's quickly removed from the plant and cast aside. I wonder, though, whether the gardener is expecting to see um, branch. I wonder what fruit, sorry, the gardener is expecting to see on those branches of the vine? Is the gardener there peeling back every single leaf looking for grapes no matter how big or small? Or are they looking for another kind of fruit? In the letter to the Galatians, Paul tells those followers that the spirit grows these fruits. And I can't remember them, um, so I am going to read them now. I've not got a, an impressive memory. 
These are the fruits of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. I wonder whether these are the fruits that the gardener in Jesus's metaphor is looking for on the branches. If they are what is being looked for, then perhaps we need to fundamentally change how we measure and compare success. Because, of course, this is a metaphor and Jesus isn't talking about a plant in a garden. Jesus is talking about us as disciples. The su successfulness of these branches is not measured on how many, if any, grapes that are produced, but on the characteristics of the branch. The things it says, the things it does, the relationships that are formed. The successfulness of the branch of us is measured on the characteristics, the things we say, the things we do, the relationships that we form. Successfulness then perhaps ought to be determined by how loving, how joyous, how peaceful, how patient, how kind, how good, how faithful, how gentle, and how controlled we are. The Easter story is the perfect example, I think at least, of Jesus redefining success. The religious leaders who felt threatened by the message of Jesus, the message that Jesus was bringing to the world, they were so threatened by that that they tried to have Jesus permanently removed from the world. On Good Friday, they thought they had won. They thought that they were successful. But three days later, Jesus was no longer dead. The measures of success, the standards used to measure successfulness, had completely changed. Jesus had completely redefined what it meant to be successful. Jesus had moved the goalposts. Because Jesus had overcome death. There was to be no victory other than that over death and sin. I wonder how different the world would be if success was not measured in numerical values. If we didn't measure how successful things were by how many people attended, by how much money was made, by how fast something was, by how many votes a particular person got, or even by how many marks you got in an exam. I think that I would have had a very different path in life had I not been uh, subject to exams? What if we declared something successful? If it was showing people love, if it brought people joy, if it brought peace and was peaceful? What if success encouraged people to be patient? What if success is kind and good and faithful and gentle? And if it gave up control? How often things are deemed successful when there's a really tight control on it? Perhaps to be successful at church, whatever successful at church might mean, we need to give up control. We need to let God work. We need to let the spirit blow through. Increasingly, I think at least, we're seeing how successful companies 
and even perhaps countries are not being successful in the words, in the, the terms that I've just set out in the fruits of the spirit. They're successful in how much money they make. They're successful in the amount of things they sell. They're successful perhaps in surveys of satisfaction. But we're beginning to see how working conditions at big multinational companies are not full of love, joy, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness or self-control. We're seeing in these fast fashion factories a lack of the fruits of spirit of the spirit. And I'm even going to suggest that perhaps in some of the countries around the world, perhaps even our own, there is a lack of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. How would the world be changed? if we shopped with companies who demonstrated a close allegiance to the fruits of the spirit, who cultivated cultures that were based on those fruits of the spirit rather than on money. And let's not forget that when we talk about money being a marker of success, it's not about how much money the people who work for the company get. It's how much money is given to its directors, to its shareholders, how much money the company is able to retain rather than letting that trickle down to the people who make that money for them. How would the world be changed if we shopped with the fruits of the spirit? How would the world be changed if we voted according to the fruits of the spirit. How would the world be changed if churches encouraged people to be the fruits of the spirit? How would church be changed if we decided that the way we were going to declare success was by how readily evident the fruits of the spirit were? rather than how many people came on a Sunday morning, how many people came to a prayer meeting, to a Bible study, even how heavy our collection plates were on a Sunday morning, dare I say. We are encouraged in another writing of Paul in his letter to the Romans to not conform to the standards of this world but to look to God for guidance. Perhaps the place that we can begin this practice is to look at what success is, to how we declare things successful or otherwise. Perhaps if we began to say something was successful based on the presence of the fruits of the spirit, and therefore the presence of God, we might live in a slightly different world. How in the things that you do, can you change success to be love, to be joy, to be peace and patience, to be kindness and goodness? How can success be faithful? How can success be gentle? And in all those things, how do we have self-control? And I think that in this example, self-control means that those things are shared and not kept for ourselves. When I was going to university or planning on going to university 12 years ago, it was the done thing. Everyone who finished their A-levels went on to university. I didn't. 
I decided I'd take a year out to resit some exams because I loved them so much and I'd try and get my grades up and go back to Sheffield. In that year out, I got a job and decided that I didn't need to go to university. I began preaching in that year. And it was in that year, deciding that I didn't need to go to university, that I realised that God had got a bigger plan for me. That actually, my A-levels don't mean anything. I'm sure those of you who have done exams and qualifications share the feeling that no one really asks you about them after a year or two. No one knows whether I've got a university degree or not, because I'm judged on how I appear to the world, not on any certificates that I might have filed away somewhere. What we think is successful, perhaps isn't successful. And perhaps we need to go in search of the fruits of the spirit rather than the ways that the world tells us that we're successful. I didn't go to university. I've not got a degree, even in theology. Some might be surprised to know. But that set me on a path to realising my calling. I wonder whether if we took a moment to step back and redefine what we thought successful was, how life might change for us and how the world might be changed, and more importantly, perhaps, how the church could be changed. How do we cultivate? How do we encourage? How do we show love, joy, peace? Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. And how is success marked by those characteristics? We're going to reflect on redefining success as we sing again. And we're going to pick up on that uh, theme of Jesus redefining success on Easter morning as we sing Lo, in the grave he lay, and then into the chorus where we are triumphant, up from the grave he arose. And so we come to pray for the world that we're a part of and the community that we live and work in. There'll be uh, times of quiet where you can offer your own prayers for people and places and situations that you know. Let us pray. Loving God, we come before you knowing that there is injustice and inequality in our world. We know that there are people who have a lot and people who don't have much at all. And so we lift the world to you in prayer. Thinking of communities which are exploited for either the people or the resources that are a part of that community. We pray for justice and equality in this world. We pray for 
the country that we live in. For those who are standing for election. For those who will be elected. Those who have been elected. Pray for all those who lead us in government, in our locality. We give thanks for our access to health care. We give thanks that many people have been vaccinated. We continue to pray for the global pandemic, for ourselves, our neighbours and countries across the world. As we approach a time of change, perhaps, we pray that the fruits of your spirit would become ever present in our lives and our communities. We pray for Matlock and the surrounding areas. People who we know and love. We pray for the churches in and around Matlock. We pray that they would be places where the fruits of the spirit grow in abundance and are shared with the community. We pray for the plans which are being put in place to resume worship in buildings. We particularly remember those who we haven't seen for a while because they're not online and we look forward to worshipping together again soon. And we pray for ourselves. we would grow in the love of the spirit that we would share the fruit of the spirit with others that our aches and pains would be eased that our joy and laughter might be amplified we give to you now our own personal concerns. We know that as we pray, we pray with other Christians throughout the world and that you hear us and that you answer prayers. We join all of our prayers together by saying the words that Jesus taught us to pray in whichever way you feel most comfortable. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. 
Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. And so our final hymn for uh, this morning, we declare the great things that God has done, that Jesus uh, is victorious and that success has been changed and shared with us. Thine be the glory. And so just a blessing for us before we share in fellowship in um, our breakout rooms. May we know the fruits of the spirit. May we know love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. And may we share those fruits with everyone that we meet. Know that God is with you this day and evermore and remains with you and all those who you love. Amen. It's, it's great to be worship, being worshipping with you uh, again. Um, next week, we'll be online, online again. Uh, Yvonne will be the steward and <coughs> Reverend Paul Beard will be uh, leading and preaching for you. So just go now in the love of God and with the fruits of the Spirit bulging in your metaphorical grocery bags to share and enjoy this week. May you be blessed this week. <laughs>